U.S. experience in the 80s and 90s, inflation targeting comes in in the 80s, pursued by the Fed under Greenspan into the 90s, until recently. In the U.S. in the 1980s, there was the savings and loan or thrift crisis in which approximately 1,300 out of 4,000 savings and loans failed in a period from 1980 to 1994. Uh, that was principally a crisis generated by a very flawed deposit insurance system that basically let them, uh, these institutions remain open when they were insolvent, bankrupt, and continued to gather deposits that were guaranteed by the government. Uh, they were called zombie institutions. Uh, I would argue that Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac are zombie institutions today. And there was the double-digit inflation which Volcker and Reagan inherited. So that, I, that's why I was very, it was hard to answer your question because yes, a lot of this went on, but they had inherited the situation. Then there were a series in, uh, in the same period of separate crises in commercial banking that had a regional basis. First, you had a Southwest banking crisis in the oil patch because of the collapse in the price of oil. And the banks had lent first on oil, then on real estate that was dependent on the price of oil in the Southwest. Then the similar crisis in New England. Then some of the major money center banks like Citibank became involved because in Citibank's case, they both had Latin American debt lending and they had large scale commercial real estate lending. There were also two notable stock market collapses in this period. The October 1987 stock market crash in which the, the, the Dow Jones fell 20% on one day. And then the collapse associated with the dot-com bubble in 2000. So the panic, uh, an economist by the name of Gary Gordon has written a paper and describes the current crisis as the panic of 2007. The panic of 2007 is only the latest in a series of financial tsunamis in this comparatively short period from 1984. The pattern is a bubble, a crash, a panic, reflation, and a new bubble. Right? They're doing it really quick now. I mean, they're, they're, this is the quickest to reflate I've ever seen. That cycle of crash and burn has terrible costs to the economy. There have been trillions of dollars of wealth lost in the current panic. And the cost of the bailout and fiscal stimulus have long since passed the $1 trillion mark. Uh, I was in uh, Liechtenstein, actually, uh, with it, when this first was breaking in early September. That is the, the, the you know, there were a whole series of rounds, July, August, September, but the, the bailout announcement came in early September. The conservative ship of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac came in, and I, was, I happened to be overseas. And the first thing the Europeans said when they heard about the bailout is they said, not in the United States. We do that. Don't you do it. And, and then they said, well, what's it going to cost? At that point, the figure being floated was $500 billion. And I said, the experience in banking crisis is that the, the cost is always underestimated initially, so that if they're saying $500 billion, it'll be a trillion. And then I came back and it was 700 billion, so my working estimate was 1.4 trillion. But I did, I did see an interesting statistic. The first President Bush finally decided he had to clean up the mess in the savings and loan industry, which Reagan had just not wanted to deal with, and he just let keep going. Um, <clears throat> and so the first President Bush went in with a plan to bail out the savings and loan industry. And his estimate, uh, turned, which was a staggering sum at the time, turned out to be 20% of the total cost at the end of the day. Now, if the same underestimation, underestimation of, of the cost of this, uh, if you project, then the $700 billion bailout plan becomes a $3.5 trillion bailout plan. Now, gross domestic product is about $13 billion, so yeah, a third of the gross domestic product of the United States. Um, I say modestly at the end, this system can't keep going on. 
I mean, there's a lot of other measures. I, I, I keep making notes to myself, add this, add this to this paper, add this. Um, the, depending on what day of the week you're talking about, the Dow Jones Industrial Average is where it was 10 years ago. Now, this is a, a huge impact for people because people have been taught that you, you invest in stocks for your retirement. All that you've had over a 10-year period is volatility, not growth. And volatility is very bad, and it's very bad for reasons I think you've, most of you have probably seen some kind of, or listened to something on the radio or read an article about. I know at your age you don't think about retirement, but consider the following problem. You just retired. Your portfolio is worth 40% of what it was. Now you retire with 40% less than you thought you were going to retire. Um, what if there's no growth for another 10 years? What's the point of saving? Um, I saw a, uh, I'm kind of a junkie, watch the cable business channels, because the only way to, I keep them muted, if something comes on, I want to see it, turn the sound on. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm typing the paper and the, the next disaster hits, so I delete and <laughs> put in a new paragraph. And uh, this financial planner, retirement specialist, who said, well, what's somebody do who's like, six months away from retirement, or a year away from retirement. He said, well, people aren't going to like my answer, but he's going to just have to work longer. <laughs> um, so this system can't keep going on. So something has to change. The, the way monetary policy is conducted has to change. And what have been academic exercises by people interested in monetary policy now have to go, become serious discussions uh, in, in the public domain. It was very bad that this crisis hit uh, in an election period, in an interregnum between two administrations. But on the other hand, uh, with somebody fresh coming in, uh, maybe there'll be some fresh ideas. Is the solution to this the introduction of the North American currency? No, I don't see how, not if we have the same kind of monetary policy. <laughs> the Federal Reserve, maybe national banks from Mexico, Canada, and the United States coming up. If you do, oh, a hard currency. Oh, oh, now you said something different, a hard currency. That's one possible solution, yes. Um, I went to uh, a conference a couple of years ago. I'm trying to remember, two, three years ago. And it, and it was a strange conference because, well, it was at a place called the American Institute for Economic Research, and, and, they, and they, they're, gold they're gold standard people. But the conference wasn't on gold standard, it was on the transition to a gold standard, which didn't seem immediately topical, but it was interesting because there were some very good pa papers, from, in, including from someone well-known people like Richard Silla, who's an economic historian at New York University. And uh, one of the people, uh, she couldn't come because she's getting elderly and a little frail, was Anna Schwartz, who was co-author with Milton Friedman of the Monetary History of the United States. She's 92, her mind is tip-top, but she's just a little frail. So we had her call in. We, I didn't run the conference, and uh, and uh, and basically interviewed her over a speakerphone, and uh, she was asked the question: Could the gold standard ever come back? So this is say three years ago. Could the gold standard ever come back? She said, only if there's a big financial crisis. Now this uh, monetary conference that I mentioned, I'm going to give a paper at the Cato Monetary Conference, November 19th. Somehow Anna's making it down to that, and uh, that'll be interesting to see what she says. Uh, so yeah, something has to, that would be one way to change it. I don't know the hard currency. Oh, um, gold standard, silver standard. Uh, money is backed by gold. You have to have, the central bank has to have reserves of gold that constrains. You could never run a 1% a one interest rate, a negative real rate of interest policy, a sustained, very easy money policy for five years and build up. Are, am I saying that Asset bubbles, uh, there's a way to eliminate them entirely? No. But I mean, this one is staggering. The story here, uh, uh, a Dow that goes nowhere, a stock market that's wrecked, and financial institutions collapsing, people's savings being wiped out, bank runs. We haven't seen bank runs since the 1930s. So these dollars that are going to uh, the bailouts, are they going to be used for greenbacks being printed? Or are we just writing more? 